Hi, everybody. How are you doing this morning? Oz, how are you doing this I'm morning? I'm doing fine. Welcome to the dev chat here at Privateer Maybe. Press for uh, May 7th? May 8th. 8th. May 8th, 2019. Uh, I'm lead developer Will Hungerford. Uh, I need a haircut. With me is someone who does not need a haircut. I, I cut it recently. It's, it's a week. It's a I was going to say, you're, you're fresh shaven. Well, plus the front is the thin part, so you, the back, you, you can't see where it's thicker on can, the screen. Can, can you grow a sweet mullet? No. <laughs> no. No, because the mullet's got to be business in the front, and there's nothing really in the front. So, I mean, party in the back. Totally. Just, oh, all not, day, every day? But not business in the front. And no, I haven't had hair of a, a significant length in 20-ish years. Because I hate it. I hate it. Hair's, yeah. hair's terrible. Uh, and in case you wonder what we're, we're talking about, we're not talking about our hair. We're talking our, about hair. We're not talking about our hair today. Welcome to Hairstream. Today we are talking... <laughs> the Hair CID 2019. We're talking about yeah, the Steamroller yeah, 2019 yeah. Uh, CID launch. Uh, but let's, let's get into a couple things. If you've never joined us before... Welcome. Welcome. We see everybody popping up in Twitch and Facebook chat right now. It's good to see all of you. Good morning, everyone. Um, we stream twice a week, but we also have some extra shows. So twice mm -hmm. a week we do yep. Dev Hangout and Get Your Paint On, Wednesdays and Thursdays at 10 a.m. Pacific. Dev Hangout is what you're watching now. We're the developers, that's Oz and I, get yep. on here and we chit-chat about what's going on with the various games. And Get Your Paint On is with our studio painter, Jordan Lamb. He's going to paint models and do conversions and talk to you about hobby tips and tricks. And then we've got two shows we do once a month. Mm -hmm. The Staff Showdown, which the next one is this th Friday. You and yeah, I are playing Mo Monster Apocalypse. Yep. And then Primecast Live, which is uh, sort of a variety show where we get people from out the company to come on and talk about a wider variety of topics of what's going on at yeah. Privateer Press. Yeah, it's, it's kind of who's available that day and what projects they're working on. Like, we bring Doug in, we bring Mike Valancourt in, we talk about art, we talk about lore, we talk about cons, we talk about all kinds of okay. stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, so if you ever miss a show and you're interested to see what we're talking about, you can catch us later on YouTube.com slash Privateer Press Prime. A uh, couple quick announcements before we get into the meat of things today. Mini Crate. So there's a lot going on with Mini Crate right now. The Asphyxius, the Undammed, is the current War Machine of Hordes Mini Crate model available until mm -hmm. May 19th. Mm -hmm. The VIP model is the Bride of Arcadius. So if you sign up for a six month subscription to get a miniature every single month, a unique sculpt of some kind, in your next shipment, you'll also get a free Bride yep. of Arcadius model. Even if you sign up the very last month, you still get that model for free. Exactly. And uh, there's another mini crate line, the Legend of the Five Rings mini crate line, which you can find at mini-crate.com slash L5R. Mm -hmm. The current model is uh, Moto Chagatai. Did I say that right? Yeah, Moto Chagatai, right? It looks like it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Unicorn Clan champion. Just mm -hmm. making sure I was pronouncing the last name right. And that's available until June 5th. That is the newest of the Legend of the Five Rings models to be available on their mini crate. And the VIP is uh, Shoshuri Sadaku. Uh, which is also a new VIP model of this, uh, the Scorpion Clan. So, Legend of the Five Rings just had two big updates with two very yep. sweet looking yep. models. We switched out the VIP model, so you can't get the Naga Archer anymore. And the Bride of Arcadius is available until August, so we're about halfway through the cycle for the VIP for the standard mini crate line. Yep. And uh, one last thing, just a reminder, everybody, next month, mm -hmm. June 21st through 23rd, Lock and Load 2019. Coming right around the corner, tickets are still available. New hotel blocks got opened up. There's more space to stay in the hotel if you want mm -hmm. to for the con. If you want to come play in just a mess of events, come to yep. hangouts and seminars. Yep. Uh, talk to Oz about mullet potential. Yeah. Hopefully my hair will be cut by then. Otherwise, you won't be able to see me. I mean, it'll be, it'll be over a month from now. So if you don't cut it closer to then, so uh, you should just leave it alone until... I'll look like the shaggy dog from Looney Tunes. You know, yeah, remember, remember yeah, like the one that you was at like part yeah, of that? Yeah. yeah. I look terrible. Yeah, and I'm hair. guessing that the next Primecast, since it is a month away from Lock and Load, will be heavily about Lock and Load. I would imagine so. And we, we might not do a Primecast in June because we stream so much at Lock and Load, yeah. and Lock and Load happens. So, yeah. So, our streaming in June will more than likely be a little different, especially the week of Lock and Load, the 21st. But you'll just get more of us. Uh, Jeff Hanley on Facebook says, uh, who's going to be playing against you in the staff showdown this Friday? That's me. Too and right. he asked what rules you'll be changing mid-game to ensure you win. <laughs> Mom Pox is, we're not playing a narrative, so you can't, we're just going to play the game. And so then, we're going to play uh, Kraken Octus and Hammer Clack versus each other with a couple of other 
monsters. I'm, I'm bringing my Zor Max and my painted up. And I think I have. I think I'm playing with Rogzor. So I think Tony got a Rogzor painted up for me to play with. And then I'll be playing mainly so, mainly guard models, but I'll probably bring a yeah, couple Shadow Gates. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna show off the monsters that are releasing this month. Yeah. And maybe preview something else. Who knows? Really? Maybe. Okay. Maybe. So today, the last CID for a little bit went live. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. As a reminder, after the CID, the Steamroller CID, uh, which lasts until next Friday, uh, CID is going on a little bit of a break, not a permanent break by any means. Yep. Um, we talked about this a bit online. I definitely went online on Facebook and clarified. Uh, CID has primarily been used to test out the new things coming on. So we just did the Infernals and the Oblivion CIDs. And they were massive because when the Oblivion book comes out, it's all that stuff together. And then those yep. actual physical models that are releasing in Infernals and Oblivion, all the Order of Illumination and the Archons and stuff, that goes well into 2020. Yeah, and you can think of it like Tharn had five new models. Right. Oblivion has 32, 33 new yeah. models? Yes. Something like that. So the Tharn models were a month of releases. But Oblivion is multiple months of releases. Yeah, and so that's so why you were CIDs seeing... are based around release blocks. Yes. So that's what's going on. Now, we've done other CIDs that are not based around release blocks, like this one, Steamroller. Yeah, yeah. And we, a while back, we did the, the Battle Engine one and things like that. But we've been having rapid-fire CIDs back to back to back to back to back, mm -hmm. right? And it's it's time to let the, the meta settle for a little bit. Yeah. Um, and there's stuff we still intend to change. Uh, there's stuff we're keeping an eye out, legacy models that we, we may just make dynamic updates that don't necessarily go through CID. I mean, that's how we've done it for a very long time prior to the CID process. Yep. The CID process did kind of move away from that, but like sometimes we do just need to change things. So just because there isn't a CID doesn't mean that we aren't still testing things and keeping an eye on things internally, watching everyone's results at events and maybe going, yeah. okay, maybe this model needs yeah. to be buffed up or toned down. And you might just see those dynamic updates come. So don't want everyone to think that with the CID taking a short break that you're not going to continue to see the game being tended to. Yeah. But in, and I was talking about this on my stream last night. Somebody asked me what the intended effect of, of a CID break is, or one of the things I hope to see. One of the things I hope to see is a natural meta is a certain list or archetype get, becomes popular, right? Mm-hmm. Let's just say cloud walls. Cloud walls become the rage, like cloud wall sure. lists. So then the natural predators of that list, people that can see through cloud walls, rise to power. And then another thing that can prey on those lists yeah. comes up, and then the cloud walls kind of yeah. come out of favor. And this kind of cycle keeps happening with all kinds of different archetypes. It's not just as easy as just three, right? But things rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall. And that's a natural, healthy meta, mm -hmm. where the players in the community are driving those changes based on what is becoming popular. CID kind of messed with that a bit because sure. with CID, people got in the habit, or at least I think that people got in the habit of, I'm not necessarily going to experiment. This is not everybody, but I know some people have told me this pretty much flat out, that they weren't going to experiment and try and do that. They were just going to wait for their CID. Yeah. That they were like, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to bother trying to find an answer to this. I'll wait till CID fixes my stuff, and that is not a perception we want to see it reinforced. Mm -hmm. Player experimentation is a good thing. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of really smart players and creative players in our community uh, that that can do these things. And so taking a short break and not and pulling back that reliance on I'll wait for CID to fix my my stuff and letting yeah. people just experiment and and do their own thing I think is healthy and good for the game. Yeah. So. That's and we'll and we'll talk more about the future CID schedule when it gets closer. Yeah, and that's the thing. We are going to announce yeah. like the, the next CID is when it gets a little bit closer. We don't want to, it. It will likely be after lock and load, if I had to guess. Oh yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a little while. Yep. But let's talk about the CID that's happening right now. Right now. So Steamroller 2019 CID just went live today. Mm -hmm. So Steamroller 2019 had a, a minor revision. Right, Steamroller basically falls into one or two categories. Minor revision, which means we take what was going on last year, the previous years, we look at the year's worth of results, we figure out what we want to tweak, we change a couple scenarios, maybe a couple objectives, maybe a couple rules. Mm -hmm. And then major revisions, which we've usually seen around like the year after the launch of Mark III, yeah. when we first introduced like the concept of dominating back in Mark II, like mm -hmm. you saw the scenarios completely change around that. There's been larger revisions. This is one of the minor revisions. Yeah, 2017 was the big change of 
zone types are scored by model types and those kind of things. And and then needing to win by five more, not just the first person to get to five, mm -hmm. which that was a huge meta shift yep. in and of its own. Because previously people would probably just jam out, get to five, win the game, no matter if your opponent was at four CPs. When it became five more, that was a, a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. So why did we go with a minor revision instead of a major revision? Part of that, there's a lot going on this year in terms of what's coming out for War Machine of Hordes. You've got the new faction for Infernals. You've got all this cool stuff coming out in Oblivion with the Order of Elimination and the Archons. You've got these, these very different new theme forces coming out, like Hearts of Darkness, that allow like cross-faction play. Mm -hmm. And then there's a revised rule book coming in Oblivion, which we've talked about, but we haven't gone into like deep detail. We've mentioned that it's like sure. sort of cleaned up with a lot of errata and dynamic updates, but there are other changes in it, stuff that we, we wanted to see happen. Yeah. Uh, and we'll be going into detail about that later. Um, but with all that happening, it was not also the time to do a massive overhaul of Steamroller. We did test some things. Yeah, so we, we try out experimental tweaks yeah. internally a lot and go with them. Or like, like, I remember when we first said, what if different model types scored different zones? Yes. And we played a couple of different variations on that, which, which shapes were which models and those kind of things. And so sometimes those ideas go away, and sometimes they stick, and sometimes they don't last through CID, and sometimes they do, so, yeah. yeah. So we tested a bunch of different things, and one thing, and I'm, I'm gonna actually talk about one of the things that didn't make the cut. So you, you all get to see a sort of behind the scenes, sure. like this didn't make it. Mm -hmm. um, but when we tested a couple of these new things, what we've come to the conclusion of is that Steamroller in its current iteration, without a major revision to how Steamroller is, in its current iteration, is, is tapped out on complexity. Um, the more we add, the more things that you add that a player has to decide before the game begins or after mm -hmm. the game ends, especially for new players, it's just a lot. The, the jump from Battle Box Journeyman to Steamroller Tournament play is already pretty big. Yeah. And so there were some things we want to do. I'm going to give you, give you an example here. We were looking at ways to increase the way a player could attack the scenario, the way that they... They individually looked at the scenario and said, this mm -hmm. is how I intend to win on, on scenario. So we tested something called priority targeting. Uh, and the way it worked is you rolled off, you picked sides, and then before the game began, whoever was going first chose one scenario element on the board. It could be a flag, it could be a zone, it could be an objective. Mm -hmm. Whenever they scored that thing every time throughout the game, they got two CPs instead of one. Then their opponent chose one, and they did the same thing. And so you had the, each player had their own unique choice Yep. So if you chose an objective, it was a one and done. If you destroyed it, you got two CPs, but that was the easiest one to get versus holding zones. Mm -hmm. Or you could pick a zone or a flag and say, every time I score this zone or flag, I get two CPs. Yep. We tested it, and it didn't make the cut for two reasons. One, if both players chose the same zone, like a zone off to the side, yeah. the whole game took place in about a two-foot by two-foot block off in the corner. Yeah, that's weird. It wasn't great. The second part was, as a new player, whenever they would make this decision, if they made the wrong decision, it led to mm -hmm. a lot of the game is over before it has started. Yeah. So we had really yeah. good, interesting games with the rule. And we had things where it definitely shaped what people were doing. And then we had enough bad ones where we kind of went like, okay, this isn't going to make it. Mm -hmm. And that's when, that was one of many things we tested when we realized that Steamroller's kind of at its, its limit for for complexity. Anything more we add like that, decisions you make before or after, it's just gonna keep yeah, making it too unapproachable. Yeah, we have to lower something before we put something else in. Yeah, or just redo the whole thing. Well, that's what I mean. Like, it'll be a more, a, a larger revamp. Yep. Uh, so, let's go ahead and talk about some of the changes, but I wanna get a couple of these, let's see if there's any. You don't need to talk about Twitch chat at all, it's just speculation on our pants. Twitch chat is speculating on our uh, pants. Is that what Twitch chat's been talking about the all whole time? I've been, that's why somebody, somebody uh, Nick in Facebook told me to smile. When I'm reading, I don't smile because I don't want to give you guys any clues as to what I'm reading. And there's a lot of it about our pants situation, speculation. Tony getting in there and asking what's the appropriate amount of time to be pantsless, especially at work, which it just depends, I think, on your job, like someone said. But yeah, pants, pants speculation. Sure. Uh, so, so Jacob, Facebook ch chat was more on, on topic. Yeah. So Jacob Troxel in Facebook chat says, can we get more scenarios where the zones aren't all in the middle? Well, that's what we gave you. So let's actually go yeah, into the if new... You, if you haven't gone to the CID forums yet, 
and looked at the new stuff, we're about to show it to you. But you can also go sign up at cid.privateerpress.com. Mm -hmm. And, and um, we have to let you in just to make sure that people's names aren't offensive and stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you don't get in immediately as soon as you sign in, just wait a little while. During the CID, especially at the launch, we check that, that name thing more yeah. often. But usually, as the CID is going, it's at least once a morning. Yeah. So let's get into the Tony. new scenarios. Maps. So Wait, three scenarios are staying Ma from maps. last year. Maps. What is happening? I'm trying to make the maps appear, and Tony's not making them appear. <laughs> Take this pig, at least. Okay. Holy crap. All right, so spread the net, invasion, and recon two all remain. The three that are changing are uh, standoff, the pit two, and good old, good old mirage. Mm -hmm. So let's start off with the first replacement, which is king of the hill. So King of the Hill is replacing the pit, too. Mm -hmm. First thing you're going to notice is that the side zones are literally touching the table yeah. edges. Somebody in, in the, the chat, there was another comment about the middle of the table fights are boring. Mm -hmm. can, we, can, we, can we do something else? And this is, this is that scenario. This is, you don't have a fight just in the middle of the table. Yes. And that's one of the things we, we wanted to do. Um, we chose the scenarios we were keeping because we've been looking at the data for, for all year long. Basically, we have a, a year-long CID. T I see Tony's at, typing up text questions. That's what I'm answering right now. Tony, I got you, boo. We get a year-long CID effectively for Steamroller. Yeah, we get a lot of feedback about how Steamroller is working, mm -hmm. and we run some of our own at you know, Gen Con and Lock and Load and, and other places. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we're basically constantly considering changes to Steamroller. And a few of the scenarios we found in general uh, were... As a, it's okay to have a couple grindy scenarios. It mm -hmm. is okay to have a couple like grindy scenarios, but there was a couple of them that in conjunction with some of the things we wanted to change, were uh, it was gonna be a little bit too much grindiness. And we also had been playing with the idea of really spacing out where you were fighting across the board yep. so that everything isn't just funneling directly into the middle or kind of offset to the middle. Like recon, too, is a good scenario, but it's mainly just fighting in the middle and the two lanes on the yeah. offset. And it's okay to have a couple like those, but if we're gonna do that, we need some that really kind of like push things out there, whether it's the incursion style of fighting over the three flags, or it's something like King of the Hill. So King of the Hill was the first one we started testing where we have never put zones literally touching table edges. That's where we started off. We've been playing this scenario a lot and having a blast with it. Yeah, it, it really changes up what kind of game you're playing because the stuff on the edge of the table, like Ambush, people are talking about in the... Oh, yeah, Ambush is now. Ambush's stock it, is going way up in SR 2019. I mean, it, it, models can get placed in that zone when they ambush, so that's a completely different way and that is the an, game can turn out. Steamroller is a dynamic scenario pack. Things are stronger in some years, and things are weaker in some years. Mm -hmm. That is just the, the way it will work by the nature of the scenarios. Ambushing models, stock is going up in SR 2019. So things that are interesting and things that test we found is that lower control range... Casters definitely have to hard commit one way or the other. They got to fight over the middle and yeah. try and maintain not only because the middle zone is double scoring potential. You got the flag and the zone. If yeah. you can, if there you was can, a question what the triangle is, and the triangles on the maps are flags. The circles are objectives. Yeah. So if you can get in the middle and just dominate the middle of the board, then you've got two CPs that you can get every single turn. But you're probably gonna have to, to swing hard one side or the other to take one of those flanks. Are you gonna squeeze Hamilton? Just every once in a while. What? Just just, just yeah. randomly throughout yeah. the show. Yeah. As long as you don't make him squeak. Um, don't worry. He won't squeal yet. But larger control range casters can try and play right up the middle and try and maintain both yeah. zones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so our concern when we were first testing it is, was this too punishing on low uh, control range casters? We found no. Mm -hmm. And then in the testing notes, that's one of the one things I've asked people to test, is try those Fury 5, Focus 5 casters and let us know how it's playing. You know, we found that if you have your, your Gortons and so on kind of move mid flank and off to the side and just really fight over, um, especially if you fight over the zone where your opponent's objective is. Yep. Like if you put something to contest your own objective, but you try and take theirs out and, and take their, that zone from them and then hold the middle in any meaningful capacity. Yep. But at the same time, if you can kind of harass the other zone or keep things over, which especially ambushing units are good for, uh, I think there's a lot of potential and there's a lot of uh, strategic options in King of the Hill. So, but we're looking for things that are not necessarily fun, and we're making sure these scenarios are not like too super duper grindy because yeah. that's kind of covered by, uh, I would say invasion and recon are a little bit grindier, and standoff can be. Yeah. But we're looking, we're, we don't necessarily want the 
the pit uh, two style, everybody in the middle fight. Yeah. And the feedback we're looking for the most in this CID is, are these changes to Steamroller impactful and in a good way or bad way? Yep. Do they make you make interesting army choices? Are they different enough? Are they mixing things up enough and, and are there different options? We'll talk about that more with the objectives and stuff. Two questions came up. John Jr. Henry on uh, Facebook says, is Killbox still 12 inches? But yes, only from your table edge. It doesn't affect the side edges, so you don't have to worry about that whatsoever. And a couple of people brought up that uh, Jack Marshall's Juniors and Lesser Warlock stock is going up. That is also true. If you have those lower control yep. range casters, that's something I was doing in my playtest, particularly playing minions, was having Wrong Iron Snap Jaw run over to one of the side zones and do their own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next one, Bunkers. So if Incursion had become Mirage's life coach, <laughs> Bunkers would have happened. Wow. Hmm. Wow. There are a lot of people out there that don't have any idea what that sentence means. I know. But okay. So, take Incursion, right? But with sure. the new scoring rules, you can't just do Incursion. And obviously, we're not doing Disappearing Flags. Uh, the, the three spread out across the middle has always led to fun games. I actually am paying very close attention to testing whether or not the side flags we want to pull even further towards the edges. And we might during the course yep. of this CID. Mm -hmm. We've been testing them with the original Incursion style placement. However, what we've added is a pair of CP batteries, and those are your bunkers. They're incredibly close to your own table edge, and mm -hmm. the idea is as long as you leave a model in the middle uh, to, to score that zone, you're getting a CP every single turn when scoring starts. The idea is to fight across the three flags, and then if you can either take your opponent's objective out, or if you can run up and just contest their zone to stop that CP for a single turn, Yep. You can swing the momentum. So let's say they put a, a blockhouse or structure inside their zone, or they keep a colossal in there, and they're gonna be scoring every time. That's fine. Can you run one model up on your turn and say, you don't score, I do score? Yep. If that happens, and you can get that momentum, but that requires you to either go around the flanks, where the flags naturally are, or push through the middle. And I think that's gonna be the main fight here, is trying to shut mm -hmm. off those batteries. At least in our play tests, that's where it's been. Um, so we want to make sure, again, that this is a live scenario, that people are, are being able to make uh, meaningful decisions. And uh, kind of considering taking the two outer flags back probably about four inches, so they'd yeah. be eight inches from the edge. Yeah. That has been on our mind, but we're seeing what's going on. Uh, people are bringing up five-point ter turns are possible, six-point turns are possible. Absolutely. And that's true in the current packet. Like, technically, in spread the net, you could, you could score that much. It's okay to be able to score, like if you can take all three flags, hold your zone and destroy their objective, you get five CPs. But if you're holding all three flags and your objective, uh, your zone and you destroy their objective, you are controlling the table. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of control yeah, in general. And, and that's one of the reasons I'm thinking about pulling the side flags back about eight inches is so that it's even more of a, you really have to control the table to be able to get the middle line of flags. Yeah. Uh, a couple people are asking if the flags are going to disappear. No, we are not bringing back the randomly disappearing flag. As no. it turns out, uh, tournament players like reliability and they like their plan to like to build a plan and then execute it. Mm -hmm. And having RNG completely remove an aspect of the plan that's great for narrative play, where you're just sort of like the crazier stuff can happen, and you're sort of like having to to deal with the effects of what's happening. But yep. uh, for yep. tournament play, we try and keep it a little bit more like straight balance. Yeah. There's, a, there's also quite a few questions about structures in there. Placing blockhouses in the bunkers, structure scoring, those kind of things. Oh, they're asking if structures are scoring now? Uh, no, they wouldn't. Uh, that's going to actually be a top. So right now, they're, they're, they're not scoring. I used a blockhouse as a bad example. Sure. Uh, they do contest, obviously. But there is a chance we're going to have a dev talk or a discussion about whether or not structures have, have, have uh, scored. We've tested it both ways. Right now, we're still using the 2018 rules. Mm -hmm. So... But it's something we might talk about during the course of the CID. Start off testing them as if they were doing normal, which is to say they weren't yep. scoring. They are contesting, though. Uh, and let's move on to Anarchy. Anarchy. Anarchy, to me, is shades of close quarters-ish. So you take the old close quarters style, but then you add a pair of circular zones off in the middle. This scenario has a lot going on. Obviously, if you try and fight for control of the middle, the best you're doing is taking out the enemy objective and getting two flags. Yep. It's pretty strong. You, far more so than in King of the Hill, really have to commit and take one of those, those side zones. Obviously, ambush models 
are going to be very strong here because they are the type of model that scores those zones. Yep. So if your opponent just ignores one and you brought ambush, they don't have a model over there, you mm -hmm. can just suddenly on, say, top of three, ambush in and be like, free CPs, yep. right? So you have to consider both of them. We've tested these with the low focus casters, you know, with the low control areas to see how they handle it. And really those casters that can rely on self-sufficient infantry and solos to go deal with those zones while they hard commit to one flank or the other, mm -hmm. or they go dead center and then turn and yep. go one way or the other, is the way we've seen most of those games. Whereas the higher control casters can kind of hang out near their objective and do whichever way they need to. Um, we've had really good test results on Anarchy. We're looking for the same kind of things. Um, is it live? We know Ambush is strong in it, and that's okay. Uh, considerations, I am thinking about taking those flags and moving them back a little bit. At the moment, a yeah. single model can contest both of them at four inches, yeah. and that's, <clears throat> that's okay. That's intentional. That's something that we've been testing with that we wanted. Um, it's worked well in the games we've had, being able to put, because that model's been basically standing right in the middle of the board. Yeah, and it gives so you, people are asking, the flag is 21 in, and 24 is the center of the table. Yes. So there, there's around three inches between where the flags, where the center of the table is and where the flag is, and they're offset a little bit. So it's around six inches, but not, not, that's not a perfect measurement. Yep. So we may take those flags and pull them back just a little bit closer to mm -hmm. their own objectives, maybe about two inches each. Yep. Uh, but we'll see. We'll, 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 we'll see if that's... And they're going to stay along the same line where they're, they're offset from the yeah, objective. Yeah, they're two, they're two inches off the center line now. We yeah. might pull them farther away from that center line. So one thing that you can see what we're doing with the scenarios we kept and the scenarios, the, the new scenarios that are being replaced, you still have your traditional take sort of the strong, I hold up the middle of the board, I've got a tough sort of brickish army, I can play well mm -hmm. into things like recon and get up there. But then we have things where mobility and ambush and... Uh, utility is far stronger. Yep. Uh, Anarchy, King of the Hill, if you can get models out to the sides and then reasonably support them or take armies that have self-sufficient sort of blocks that can go do this, you're in a great place. And at the same time, you're going to have to contend with the more spearhead straight down the center. And that's what we're looking for yep. out of a packet is a variety of scenarios that don't all benefit the same type of army. They benefit a variety of armies. Uh, spread the net obviously is a weirder one and kind of supports somebody that where their caster or jacks can hold back while everyone else runs off and does their own thing across a, a larger, larger portion of the table. Yeah. But it also benefits some of those battle engines that are sturdier that can go over there with high armor and fight. Yeah. Maybe they're fighting some infantry, some ambushing light infantry or something that can't handle them. Yeah. And Kirk Beck says he thinks this change not only affects ambush, but also affects those heavy infantry that can walk up and just hold a zone. You're absolutely correct. We've seen that happen mm -hmm. in our playtests as well, where somebody would late take a single unit of, say, shield wall infantry like Man of Wars and just have them go off on their own. And their whole job was to sit at the edge of the zone in shield wall and just hold the line and to make some people come, come deal with them. Mm -hmm. uh, flood the zone list might be better or worse, Josh Steffen says. That's the testing. Like, if you're doing that, are you also as strong into recon yep. and the other scenarios? Yep. You know, you want to consider the whole thing as a packet. And again, the idea is if you play a scenario and you're like, this list was really, really good in this scenario, think about that list and the other ones. If it's really, really good in half of them and it's okay in the other half, yeah. that's solid. Yeah, it's okay if a list type dominates a scenario, especially if that list type doesn't play the other scenarios as well. Because we're, we're okay with that because you're only going to play each of these scenarios one time during a tournament. So maybe you're really strong going into one game, but you don't have the tools to deal with other scenarios. Legionnaire says this seems a little harsh for theme forces with very minimal infantry. Well, remember that most competitive events are double list. So mm -hmm. if you do have a list that you think some of this would be harsh for, bring a list that you know will be able to compete against it. And then, of course, yep. you've got your, your matchups to consider as well. But you, you do have the tools to bring a very different answer depending on what you're doing. So uh, that's the scenarios we're testing. Obviously, they are subject to change. Hopefully, we'll have an update out, I would expect, Monday, so that I really mm -hmm. want to give people the whole weekend to be able to yep. test and then see about making any changes we want to make on Monday or Tuesday morning, test out through the rest of next week, and then end everything on, on Friday. Um, before we get into the next part of the CID, uh, H2D says, Talion update? Really, really soon. <laughs> really, really. I'm not going to make any promises. I try not to make any promises. But we are proofing all the changes right now. Yeah, it's in final proof. Um, so if the proofs come back and every change was made correctly and no, like, you know, 
icons disappeared or cards got weird. It could possibly be as soon as tomorrow, but I don't want to make any promises. So don't take tomorrow as the absolute, it's going to go up tomorrow. But we're really, really close. We've got to make the final war room changes and check them and stuff. So we're just checking all the changes right now. And um, I, I hope it will be this week. That's funny. Change one model. Change one rule. It's like dropping a, a pebble into a pond, right? Like there's ripples. Mm -hmm. It goes out yeah. and it just touches everything. Yeah. yeah. And there's so many little things. But like you said, it should be any moment. It should, it should be this week, hopefully tomorrow. But no promises. Well before I get a haircut. <laughs> New objectives. So new objectives. we are not replacing the three current objectives. We, we are, are adding, adding three new. And so we originally went down to three objectives for complexity's sake. Mm -hmm. One definite piece of feedback we got is that the new objective system where you choose your objective after you know your matchup and after you know your scenario has actually simplified things a lot for players. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as big of a problem and you didn't have those objectives that were completely left by the wayside. It also let us get mm -hmm. hyper specific in what some of these objectives did because you're choosing afterwards. Yep. So with them all effectively having one unique rule and acting the same otherwise, we decided it was okay to open up this a little bit and add a couple more options. Yep. So for the previous three, you basically had one, we'll call it evergreen objective, which is uh, yeah. the ability to heal. And then two specific ones, magic weapons and pathfinder. Because mm -hmm. depending on your matchup, you may never need magic weapons. And depending mm -hmm. on the terrain layout, you may never need pathfinder. But healing, healing's almost always good, right? Yep. We decided to mimic that in the three new ones that are being added. So we have one that's evergreen in treasure chest, and then two that are specific in dugout and observatory. Mm -hmm. So. What we looked at was, what do we want to specifically provide tools for? Dugout and observatory, most dedicated range list. So let's talk about observatory first. Sure. It provides Isle of Sight to a single model for a round. Mm -hmm. Every turn, you choose a model within four inches of it, it gains Isle of Sight. Most dedicated range lists are going to have answers to cloud walls and stealth. Yeah. But another answer never hurts. Yeah. More importantly, those lists that are combined arms may not have the room in their list for the support to really get those guns to be able to do what they need if they come across a hard counter of all stealth, cloud walls, and things like that. Yeah. So now the observatory says, well, your whole army doesn't get an answer, but as long as you can protect your objective, you can get a model an answer to a hard counter against what you might be trying to do. Yeah. Uh, dugout was the same idea. There's a lot of casters out there that can push and place people via TK, feats, things like that. Excellent Texas Kruger 2, so on and so forth. And a lot of these objectives are all in zones where you want to be contesting. Mm -hmm. So we decided pushes or slams and throws and other ways of moving people, like uh, casting befuddle on them, and so on was fine. But the more prevalent ones and the ones that require often a little bit less effort, like pushes often just happen. You just do the push. Yeah. And placements usually require an offensive role, but they're really powerful anyway. So to make this objective be worth it, we created Dugout, which has the anchor rule, which says during your maintenance phase, you choose one model within four inches. It can't be pushed or placed for one round. Yeah. Note that it's not pushed or placed by an enemy effect. So with Dugout, I want everybody to really pay attention to that. You choose during your maintenance phase. If you choose a model and give it anchor, and then you try and TK it, you can't. Yeah. You've anchored it. Yeah. So make sure order of operations you don't end up messing up your whole plan because you've, you've stopped yourself. So Dugout is definitely a more specific one, but in the games where it's been useful, it's mm -hmm. been super useful. If you have to yep. run people up into a specific place and they have to hold that area so that you don't lose on CPs, and you can have a tougher model that's really hard to remove, pick up anchor and then get into place and they can't push you out, they can't TK you out, mm -hmm. they have to try and slam or throw you or something else like that, it's, it's won games before. Yep. Uh, and then, obviously, the, the all-purpose one is Treasure Chest. So at Treasure Chest, we're doing something a little different. In Treasure Chest, it's not that you get to do this every single turn. It is a once-per-game ability. Mm -hmm. Once per game, you choose a model within four inches, and this turn only, that model can reroll one attack roll and one damage roll. Of note, it doesn't have to be part of the same attack. Yeah. So it's not like I make an attack and I reroll the attack and damage roll for that attack. I can make an attack, hit, reroll the damage roll on that, then make a second attack with that same model, miss, and reroll the attack roll. Uh, treasure chest is very, 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 very strong. Yes, yeah, someone was even mentioning it was overpowered, but I don't think they had realized that it was once a game. It's that, and that, there was. I saw a lot of initial. I my like my messenger blew up this morning, and I saw some comments. People were like, "Treasure chest is broken," and then moments later, like, "Oh wait, it's once per game." Yeah, yeah. And you it, have to read all the rules. It's very important. It is once per game, and it is very strong. 
we're testing to see if it's too strong. In our testing, we haven't found it to be, if it is too strong, we're probably gonna drop it to one reroll of an attack roll or a damage roll, not both. Uh, that would be where I think I would wanna go next yeah. in terms of, of toning it. But at the moment, we feel it's, it, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, so that's the new objectives that are all in the CID. And then the other thing in the CID, which we're not bringing a graphic up for right now, is uh, we are previewing the Season 10 active duty roster. Yes, ADR for the season that starts when this steamroller hits. Now, as a reminder, ADR is now only used in Champions. It's not used in Masters whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, Champions can be a one-list format if you only want to play the one list. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's the list of casters and theme forces you're allowed to take whenever you play... Uh, Champions. Yep. One thing of note that I kind of mentioned in the opening post, but I want to really reinforce here, we're not looking for wish listing of ADR in, in the yeah. CID. And that's a thing that can happen very strong, where somebody goes, I don't like my ADR, I want this caster instead. That, that doesn't do us any good. What we'd like to see is, if you're playing Steamroller CID, and you have a choice, you can either play non-ADR casters and just try to test the scenario out, which we need people to do, right? Yeah. Try yeah. and stress test these scenarios. Yeah. But at the same time, it will be useful if people go, we decided to play an ADR matchup. I chose yeah. a caster in Theme Force on, a, on the current or the upcoming ADR. My opponent did the same. And then we played what would effectively be a champion's game. Let us know mm -hmm. how your matchups were. Let us know what you felt you were missing, what kind of list pairing you'd be interested in. You know, let us know in general yeah. how this would feel if this was an yeah. actual champion's champions game. But think about it from that list pairing angle. Don't just say, if I take this one list, I don't have any answers to all these other things. Yeah, because you have to look at what everyone else's because, options yeah. are. Yeah. If you're like, I, if you're like, I don't possibly have an answer to uh, a theme force that isn't in the ADR. Make sure you yeah. note that the theme force doesn't even exist, and yeah. that you can't possibly face it, and yeah. you don't have to worry about it. Uh, Jacob Collins says, "What is the ADR caster choice mission statement?" So the ca the ADR caster and theme force mission statement is to create a an engaging limited format where in Masters, it's, it's everything, right? Yep. And obviously, the cream of the crop, best pairings are always going to kind of rise to the top, and then people are going to try and prey on those and, and experiment. For some people, that's a lot, and we want to tone it down to where you can play certain casters and themes that may not, not necessarily rise to the top in Masters because their natural predators don't exist in Champions. Mm -hmm. So this is not necessarily, it's definitely not like the worst casters and themes, and it's not necessarily the absolute best casters and themes. It's each faction, what pairings can they create? Are they good? Are they fun to play? Are they strong together? And then how do they compete against what the rest of the field mm -hmm. is? So the way we do it, it's a pretty involved process, but one of the first things we do is we kind of create each faction's ADR individually, looking at, at, at what's good, and then once we've made the decisions of the kind of pairings we think would be strong and be fun to play, we then compare it to everything else that exists, and that's when the real work kind of starts. So we have yeah. like sort of this like initial draft, right? Just it's, its own little vacuum. Then we put it all together, and then we just start unplugging things and plugging things in and changing yeah. things and going, well, if this pairing exists, then this faction's ADR cannot conceivably deal with this mm -hmm. if they ever come into it. And do we get it right every time? No. no. There will be mistakes. Uh, some things will end up being stronger in champions than others. Some will end yeah. up being weaker. But we try to keep it as a mo ma mostly balanced sort of microcosm of play. And that's one of the reasons we're putting it into the CID for Season 10 is to show us what you're, what you're seeing. Yep. And if you played a game as a, as a ADR sort of test, you went... I played against this opponent. They were playing this list. I, my options in ADR are this, and I feel really bad about them because yep. I faced off against um, Kara Sloan Storm, uh, Storm Division, which, by the way, has some really fun builds. Yeah. And they go, I found that with my what I had, there was nothing I could do against double Storm Lances, blah, 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 right? Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff we're looking for. But also keep in mind that part of, uh, there were some questions about this, what, and the mission statement Hungerford mentioned was what, a lot what? about this. But part of what we want champions to be is you don't have to think about every single matchup possible when you're making a list from all of War Machine and Hordes. We want that limited format of when I go to this tournament, the Crix lists will all be from this small pool. I don't have to think about all these yeah. other models that more than likely that, that can't be at the tournament or are edge case things in that ADR. Or whatever. Yeah, they, they, like if you're like, I have to deal with Cricks. Well, do I have to deal with Black Industries? No, in, in Champions you don't. You're worried about uh, Dark Host and Ghost Fleets. So you're looking at infantry heavy, mm -hmm. right? 
Yeah. Somebody said uh, earlier, and I didn't say because you it was, said, so ADR is incentivizing lesser played casters, or, or sorry, incentivizing the weak casters. I think if you look at the ADR, that's a pretty hard statement to back up. Because, yeah. like, I wouldn't call Zol 2 weaker. In the current ADR, I definitely wouldn't call Iona weaker. It's not about strength and weakness. It's about fun, viable within a limited format, and having yeah. good options to play, compete, and win against the other factions that are, that are currently there. Yeah. So uh, I know that a lot of people are going to, to jump in the TNL and sort of just give their real fast sort of like wish list, I want mm -hmm. this, I want this. As just one more reminder, like that's not gonna help us. We really need to see you play games, see what your results are, and then tell us which tools you didn't have, which casters and themes you didn't have, and why that would have helped. And then we have to consider if we do make that change, mm -hmm. if we take Zal 2 out of the score in ADR and replace it with uh, Morgul 3. Sure. What does that do to er oh, not only all of Scorn's matchups, but everyone's but matchups else. into Scorn? Yeah. And one thing that is in, it gets overlooked a little bit real fast, all the battle box casters, and those are casters that come in official $40 battle boxes, yep. are automatically part of the ADR. Mm -hmm. So like Maddox is already in there. You know, yeah. Malicus is already in there and stuff like that. So, so keep that in mind when you're testing as well. Um, those, mm -hmm. I will say, are non-negotiable. The battle box casters yeah. are yeah. part of the ADR and, and must remain so. Uh, for somebody who's just wanting to jump in the game, start with a certain mm -hmm. caster, learn that one, and then if they decide to make the leap to the most competitive play, like Masters Champions level, yep. they've got somebody they're familiar yep. with. Now, the chat has turned into a little bit of conversations about what's broken and what's what's going to be too strong and there's there's a lot of comments in there about ambushing and and these new scenarios are going to lean way too much into ambushing that's why we see id things play games mm -hmm. prove your point and put that feedback on the forums don't don't argue from a point of i haven't played any of these new scenarios i can just imagine that ambushing will be broken powerful and you should change all these things because we've played them and we want to see how your play of these scenarios goes. Yep. So play some games with them, build skew lists that try to break the scenarios, take an army that ambushes entirely, and play a scenario with, with you know, edge stuff, and see how well it does, and then give us that feedback, and we can balance based on actual gameplay, not hot takes. Balderdash says, so basically all these champions are based on being able to have a decent fight against each other, so Ayana versus Krios 2 should be a decent fight. The idea is Protectorate ADR should be able to put up a decent fight against Iona. You should mm -hmm. have the tools available in your faction's yeah. ADR to put up a decent fight against anything else you might face in the other ADRs. Mm -hmm. Now, is Krios 2 the best option against Iona? And that's, you know, list chicken's always going to be a little bit of the game. You're going to have yeah. to commit to two lists. If you show yeah. up with two casters and two themes and you go all jacks and you don't bring any infantry, you're skewing yourself pretty hard on the scenarios themselves. But you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're skewing, right? Like, don't go, this one caster couldn't conceivably get it done. That's why I'm saying, if you, if you have that matchup and don't do well, go... What were my other tools available? Could yep. I have competed here? Yep. And if your answer is, I don't have anything available in my ADR to compete against this incredibly powerful list, that's when we want to then go, okay, let's take a look at this, see what was happening, what the results are. Mm -hmm. So that's my thoughts. Yep. Oz, you want to add anything? No, I'm, I, I, think I'm, I think I've said everything. I've been accused of using too much logic and reason when hyperbole is all anybody wants to talk about. And wow. Yeah. Is, is there a thing that's too much logic and reason? There's got to be a sci-fi movie where logic and reason was too strong. Probably. And the bad guys were like way too logical. More than likely. So CID, it's going on right now at CID.PrivateerPress.com. It's going on until next Friday. So mm -hmm. a week from this Friday. So please jump in and like get some games in. Test these new scenarios. Test these new objectives. Let us know what you think. Let us know your thoughts on the ADR as you play through them. Yeah. Um, we'll try and get an update out early next week and then give you another week worth of testing on them before we finalize everything. And then, of course, this all goes live the week after lock and load when the season changes over. Yeah. So uh, before we get out of here and go to lunch, let's see if we've got any other questions in the chats that we want to hit right now. Is there any other ones you saw? Nope. Striker911 says that battle reports are greater than theory. Uh, data is always better than theory, just in kind of yeah. any, any testing well, you do. But right? also, 
real game experience with something always proves out that some of your theories were right and some of your theories were wrong. Uh, like, it's very hard to say this will always happen in a game when you consider terrain and the matchup and dice rolls and all those things. Yep. Uh, any changes for terrain guidelines? No, the terrain guidelines are remaining the same. Uh, that is one thing to note is that basically use this tw the Steamroller 2018 packet with just these things changing. Yeah, we're, we're not changing a lot about this Steamroller. Uh, Angry Mohawk says, are the old objectives up for discussion? I mean, I'm not going to say nothing's up for discussion, but we're, we're very, very happy with those and, and, and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're... Play your games, and if you have some thoughts, put them in there, but I definitely don't want to see just the TNL of just the old stuff without any testing on the new things and without any data to back it up. Mm -hmm. you know? um, Legionnaire says, have there been any thoughts of scenarios that have two objectives? You mean per player, where each player has two different ones? Um, we've thought about it. We almost tested it a little bit, but we decided to, to move away from it. It wasn't exactly what we wanted. And it also, because you, those are a little bit easier to score typically than zones, because you can't contest it, right? You have to protect it. If you didn't bring shield guards, it's a CP. It pushed the CP scoring a little bit too far and they get five more. So we, we try to limit it to just one. That's part of our reasoning. Yeah. Also, there are six objectives, the three from the similar packet that exists right now and these three new ones. Yeah. These are three new we ones. We did not replace the last three. We brought the number back up to six. Uh, DGC says, when am I going to lead you, Cat, and Tony in the IKRPG stream? Uh, that may be a little bit DGC. We've got some setup to do. We've got to like, redo the whole studio to be able to get an RPG in here. I want like a fireplace in the background, Tony, right? Well, Tony can get a fireplace and put it on the green screen. We, we do that for lore chat, so yeah. yeah but I need, I need to feel heat. So can you fire. like set a styrofoam <laughs> cup on fire behind me or something? Uh, Bodyguard USA is the kill box distance up for discussion. I found in the past it seems almost irrelevant. Uh, if you want to have a conversation about it, you know, let us know. But we're actually really happy with Killbox because all that Killbox does is says, play the game with your caster. Don't hide in that back 12 inches. And if you're outside yeah. of that, that sort of area in the back, then you're in the danger zone, right? Like somebody can technically get to you. It just prevents casters running away. Yeah. Like it, there was a lot of games before... That, that rule was implemented where you couldn't necessarily win because you couldn't catch their caster. Yeah, I remember like... And that's just not, that's not fun. When I first started playing War Machine back in Mark 1 before we played with a scenario, just trying to catch Kane 1 mm -hmm. where he would just back up, shoot, teleport and you're like, that's yep. no thank you. I, I ended a game in Mark 1 once and the only two models on the table were Kane 1 and Denegra 1. Oh, that game never And ended? we just were like, good game, yeah, that draw. Game. So, because, yeah, it was like, I don't come near you and you don't come near me, and then we're just done. Uh, so we're, we're, we're pretty good with where Killbox is right now. If mm -hmm. there's like a really, really strong reason, we'd love to hear it, but there definitely needs to be some, some, some data to, to back up. Yeah. And I would be really trepidatious about moving it any farther forward. Oh, you can't really go farther forward because that punishes some backline casters too much. Yeah. So it looks like we got to... Most of the questions, as a reminder, hopefully the tally and CID or the tally and dynamic update is this week. Everything yep. is in final proofing right now. Yep. So uh, we're right there. We just got to make sure that nothing goes wrong and hopefully we'll be seeing it soon. Uh, please come join us tomorrow for Get Your Paint On with Jordan Lamb at 10 a.m. Pacific. And then join us again on Friday for the weekly rumble between Oz and I. We're playing, playing some, some Monster, Monster Apocalypse. And then uh, at the end of the month, May 24th, Primecast Live. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a whole bunch of different guests on. We're going to talk about a bunch of different stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's it, everybody. Get to CID.PrivateerPress.com, please. Get your test again. We've got a week and a half. And then CID is on a little bit of a break before it returns. That's because we've got a little thing called Lock and Load right in the middle. Don't forget, pplockandload.com. You can go pick up your tickets right now. Yeah. All right. We done? It's lunchtime. Is I'm going to Jimmy playing? John's. I don't hear anything. Tony's going to Chipotle. Actually, you want to go to Chipotle? That's not how you pronounce that word. Chip, chip bottle? We'll That's talk better. after. That's better. Kind Tony of, doesn't like to commit because he doesn't want to seem like he's yeah. doing any advertising. It's not advertising. I'm just talking about eating food. Ah. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>